I just want to say, this is a very happy moment for me. To see the two of you together, reunited, the two kings of comedy, I I'm sure it must be very exciting for both of you. Isn't it? Well, we're off to a great start. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Tonight we have two of my all-time favorite actors, and here to introduce them, my all-time favorite co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Daily News. The National Actors Theater is presenting The Sunshine Boys, Neil Simon's very funny and very touching play about two ex-vaudevillians. It is really beautifully acted by two of New York's most beloved performers, Tony Randall and Jack Klugman. Gentlemen, welcome to Theater Talk. Nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, this is really, uh, really a lovely play, and, and I must tell you, a terrific, terrific production that your company, the National Actors Theater, is putting on. Um, how, Mr. Randall, did you decide on this play, and when you picked it, did you think you were going to do it with your old uh, odd couple teammate, Jack Klugman? Sure, I picked it for him, but uh, don't call me Mr. Randall. <laughs> Tony, <Yeah. laughs> my old friend. Sorry, Tony. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I was looking for something for Jack and me to play, and it seemed that perhaps we had passed the the mark when we can do the odd couple anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, it had been suggested over the years, but I always thought we were too young for it. Let me tell you, I, I didn't remember it as well. I didn't like it as much, I thought, when I first saw it. It was good, and I, there were wonderful performances, it was good. But I just didn't think it held up for me. It was just a lot of jokes. And, but I reread it and just fell in love with it. And it tears you apart. Yeah. There's oh. much more than jokes to it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So uh, when you say that you were a little bit past the Odd Couple stage, you had done the Odd Couple, though, together at the, uh, on tour, hadn't you? Many, you many times, before? about seven or eight tours. And the summer before last, we played it all summer in London. In London. Where they, some people hinted that we might be a little longer. What, what some, guy, <laughs> some guy wrote that we had passed our sell-by date. <laughs> That's one of their favorite expressions. <laughs> you know, it's so, it's so silly in a way that if somebody 16 tries to play somebody 80, he's commended for it. Mm. But if someone 80 tries to play someone a little younger, they say, oh, what a ridiculous piece, trying to get away with something. We weren't lying. We weren't saying, look at us, we're young people. This is a part, and We're I think we do it very act. well. We can do these parts <laughs> yeah. very well. Right. And we did them very well. The audiences just loved it. But they don't seem to matter. What the audience feel doesn't matter to the critic who says, they're too old. Mm -hmm. Best sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, uh, for the Sunshine Boys, though, you really are 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 are, are perfect for those parts. No, I'm You're about too young. ten years. You're too young. No, I'm about ten, ten years, years too old. old. Really? Yeah. Really? According to what it says in the script. Uh -huh. we, at the beginning, we were all kind of shuffling along as we were rehearsing, and the director said, "What are you guys doing?" Well, you know, these are two old guys. He said, "Fellas." You're eight years older than these characters. That's <laughs> right. realize that. We feel so young. It's amazing your transformations on the stage. I mean, when you enter, you're, you're, you seem 20, 30 years older than you are mm. now. You also yeah. seem like you put on weight, too. You know, mm. you've got the, the jowls there. Mm. You look, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's all acting. <laughs> um, Neil Simon must uh, must be pleased with this production because you know it came at an odd time for him this year. Yeah. It opened after Proposals, his new play, which did not get a good reception, is now off the boards. And then you know a play he wrote in 1972 comes along, and this is the one the critics loved, which he hadn't seen. Yeah, no good. He hadn't seen it since. Since then, no. And he said, "My God, a lot of people haven't seen this play." I said, "Oh yes, there are a lot of people that haven't seen it that will see it." And he loved it. He came with his wife, who had never seen it before. And she was ecstatic. She said, I haven't laughed this much. But he said, it's so fascinating. You guys are up there yelling at each other, want to kill each other, hating each other. And all we see out in the audience is love. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Now, we hadn't realized that, but it's an amazing thing. that It's true that, that what we have in life, too, never personal. Any dis disputes we ever had in work were never personal. It was always to make it better. Mm -hmm. Well, so. I saw the play just the other night, and, and I wonder if you get this every night. There was an, an it, it also was an out-of-town audience, really. I was sat with a bunch of people from Shriners, I think, from Minneapolis. <laughs> but there was a great outpouring of affection for you two. I mean, you really are these sort of beloved uh, icons, if that doesn't make you sound uh, too, too past your cell by day. That's not the right word. <laughs> uh, things have changed. When we were growing up, the movies were everything. And you saw these gods and goddesses on the silver screen, huge. You saw Clark Gable and 
Joan Crawford and Greta Garbo. And they were gods. They were gods to, to, to America and to the world. We are of a different age television. We've come into their homes. That's where they've seen us. And they think they know us. Yeah. They believe they know us. They rarely call us by our names, Oscar, Felix. We're friends. <laughs> We're not gods. We're not icons. Right, We're right, friends. Right, right. And they feel they know you intimately. A peculiar thing was Johnny Carson, because of the hour he came on late at night. Yeah. So many women watched him while lying in bed. <laughs> and there, there's a peculiar disorientation. If I can see him, he can see me. <laughs> and that, that happens. And the, a whole nation formed an erotic attachment to him because of that. <laughs> now, you guys really can't walk down the street without being recognized. I mean, no matter where you go. I've, I've actually sort of been with you at a party or something like that, and, and people oh, that's, you know, that's Felix. So you must get that. I don't know if you take the bus, but if no, you no, ever no. take the bus, do you get that all the time? Oh, yes. But we, I love it. They always come up to us with a smile. Mm -hmm. It's always, <gasps> and it's, their association is with something funny and uh, Their enjoyable. associations are peculiar. I've never told this story, I'll tell it. Uh, a well-known woman came up to me in a restaurant, said, I'm going to write something down. I want you to give this to Jack Klugman. <laughs> a member of her family had died. She was convinced that the death was mysterious. And she said, only Quincy can solve this. <laughs> That's scary. She said that straight to me. She said, now I want you to tell this to Jack Klugman. And she wrote it all down. <laughs> wow. Um, people always ask me, as I want, about their health. I say, I can only help you if you die. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I just want to quickly ask you, though, when you do uh, roles like uh, Felix Unger and Oscar Madison, and you are so closely identified with mm -hmm. those roles, ever any trouble for you uh, as an actor uh, that people only know you as that? Does that ever overshadow anything you tried to do after it? And does that bother you? Because I've heard actors complain so. I'm identified with no. the role and I can't get out of that. No, not really. But in this case, in doing Sunshine Boys, there are some similarities. And so, as we were rehearsing, he did some clean and neat things, dirty things. He said, well, gee, they'll associate it with the art club. And we started to stay away from him. We said, no, it's not true. It's not the art club, but we're doing this play. I think it's one of the most enjoyable. But at the same moments. time, being Oscar didn't didn't militate against your acceptance no. as Quincy. No, but they tried. Oh, sure. But see, the, not the people, but the people that hire you right. will want you to do the same thing. And they kept calling me for sitcoms. I said, I just did the best one. I'm not going to do another sitcom. Right. So I said, when I decided to do Quincy, they all called my agent and said, what are you crazy? He's going to play an undertaker. He's turning down my comedy part to do an undertaker. <laughs> they won't accept it, but the audience will. Did you have that trouble too? Is it finicky Felix Unger? Is that what the people who run Hollywood wanted you to do or television? They expected, it, yes, and I won't do it. Uh, I'm offered a lot of those parts. I just won't take them. Um, I, now, of course, I have a few years on Michael, so I think of your careers from way before the Odd mm -hmm. Couple. And I remember uh, hearing an interview with you where you said, I have always worked. Since I began as an actor, I have always worked, and I was so impressed that, by that because, you know, as we have many aspiring actors watching, I thought, how does he do that? I don't know. I've never heard anyone able to match that story. Yeah. It was just luck, I suppose, but since I started, I was never out of work. Is it, that was this true of you? No, I went three starving, <laughs> four starving years, terrible years, wonderful years, though they were the best years. I had so much time to read and see things and see plays, but I... Starved, couldn't get it. I wasn't doing well, mind you, but I was working. But you were always working. At least paying the rent. Jack, when you were one of the things you did work in was my favorite musical, Gypsy. Wow, that yeah, was absolutely. 1960. I'd already been in the business well, <laughs> 42 years. <laughs> what, what do you remember about working with Julie Stein on that? Oh, that was I remember oh, Ethel Murmur. That's what I remember. <laughs> oh, remember. Julie Stein didn't want me in the play. He said they wanted me because I was a good act, they thought, but he said, come on. It's got to be a guy that can act, that can sing a little bit. This guy can't sing at all. And, but they hired me, and we were in Philadelphia, and Julie came to me and said, I wrote a song for you, it was solo. You didn't even want me in the play. He said, well, you've learned how to sell a song. And he played it for me. And it was a wonderful song where she leaves the restaurant after she steals things, and the waitress says, 
where did the nice lady go? And she looked, and I say, she's many things, but nice she ain't alone on stage. I said, I'll let you know. And we were in Philadelphia, and I went to the hotel, and I slept that night. I had a nightmare. 1,800 people. The woman leaves, and I have to hit the belt. Go, where do I go? No, no, no. I said, Julie, take that song and shove it. He said, do you realize what the actors would do, a singer would do, for a song written by Stephen Sondheim and Julie Stein? I said, I don't want to prove that I can sing. I can't. And that was it. And they cut it out. Then Julie Munson did the play. said, what is this, a talkathon? Where are the songs? <laughs> but you, you got to sing song. Rose, I Love You, but don't yeah. count your chickens. But, but Steve Sondheim would imitate me, you know, with our Rose. Once at a party, I said, I don't appreciate that, Steve. You're going around making fun of the way I said, no, no, he said, I'm not making fun. He said, I wish I could do it the way you do it, which was, ah, it was terrible. <laughs> now, but somebody told me that your being with Ethel Merman in, in Gypsy helped you get the job in The Odd Couple. Well, it made him a star. The way that did that way. I thought the guy saw me replace Walter Matthau, uh -huh. but it wasn't that. Gary Marshall saw me in Gypsy, and he said, I saw Ethel Merman singing to you, and she was spitting all over you, <laughs> and you never showed. I said, that's a good actor. And he hired me for the hot couple on Perfect that. for Sunshine Boys, by, by the way, because he's spitting all over <laughs> yeah, you in this play. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the National Actors Theater. Mm -hmm. You have been around now since, what, 90... 92. We 92. 91. Fall of 91, we Right, are. and a dream of yours for My a long time, yes. your whole life. Uh, it did get off to a rocky start, but in the last couple of seasons, you really seem to have hit your stride. Uh, you've had a terrific production with Inherit the Wind. No, that's, uh, that's true enough, but it's not true. All right. We had terrific productions from the start, but there was an animate version, especially at the New York Times. From Frank Rich and, mm -hmm. and his then-girlfriend and wife, Alex Witchell, who really seemed to have it in for you all the they time. They seemed to, and nobody knows why. And uh, we had productions I was very, very proud of indeed. They're as, as good as anything we've done. And uh, they just slaughtered them. And then that atmosphere slightly dissipated. And uh, Well, I'm wondering, though, because it wasn't just for always Frank's reviews, but some of the reviews for the earlier productions were not that great. But the reviews now, the way the critics are I, reacting I'm to sorry, the shows yes, now, now the reviews are, better. Are, but, are, are, are really, really yes, good. The reviews were, you're, you're quite right, the reviews were, Largely bad, but they were wrong. The productions were good. And one production, one production which they made an exception for, I won't tell you, they, um, they really gave it really remarkable reviews. It was terrible. <laughs> which one was that? I'm not going to tell you. Come on. No, no, but I, I, I just, I would have guilt flashes when, when I'd even see the name of the play. <laughs> that beautiful play I'd done such a terrible job on. And, and that they liked. So, but I only... The they only, judgment, torture you if they the only that. judgment that I believe is my own. And uh, I knew when it was good and when it wasn't good. All right, well, but, you know, I have to go with my judgment. And I just want to ask you, though, um, in the last three years you did Inherit the Wind, a really terrific production. Yes. You and did. you were terrific in it. Yeah, and unfortunately George C. Scott yeah. had all those problems, had to leave, but it was a really wonderful production, wonderful. I thought. And I, and, I, and, I, and I liked the gin game very much. Oh, yes. Terrific performances by uh, Julie Harris and, and Charles Durning. And the Sunshine Boys is great. And I just wonder if, you know, maybe at the National Actors Theater you found the plays that you do really well, which is these sort of great um, boulevard-type entertainments. Not really old plays, not Ibsen, not <coughs> Chekhov or Strindberg or... O'Neill, but really the, the, the very nice, uh, popular plays that we haven't seen for a while that well, give two terrific actors a uh, chance to do some star turns. And what, and, and, and what, there's nothing wrong with that. No, there's nothing wrong with it at all. But uh, we've done better productions. A Time of Athens, I think, was our very best production. That was production. Brian Bedford. Was in that yeah. Place. That was really the kind of theater I believe in. And uh, that got wonderful notices from everybody. Raves. And it lost $100,000 a week. <laughs> so that hurt worse than bad notes. <laughs> so, so in other words, maybe it's not a, best, a matter of critics, but a matter of what the public wants to see. And well, they that, want to see you guys. Yes, that's and it, of course. The, the difficult play is it's hard to get the public to come see. It's hard to get them to come see Ibsen. Mm. Very hard to get them to see Chekhov. Yeah. Um, Sheridan's 
rather hard to get them to see. Go, go. <laughs> Calderon. I'm not, 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 not giving up. I mean, he would like to do them. I will do Let's them all, just, though. That's, 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 what, that's what we're in business that's to do. That's what he wants to do. So you're, you've done a lot of American plays recently, but are you going to move back into doing No, more? we began with an American play. We've done quite a few. Mm -hmm. we, our first production was The Crucible. Right. Then we did Three Men on a Horse the second yeah, season. Yeah, right, right. I've tried to do one American play a season if I could. Mm -hmm. What do you have coming up next? I have several things I'm terribly excited about, and I have only one superstition. I don't <laughs> talk about them until <laughs> I have contracts signed. <laughs> <laughs> but he mentioned Lysistrata. I'm very keen on doing Lysistrata, and that's, that's very much in the works. Yeah, that would be that would be a terrific, terrific play to do. Are you going to tour the Sunshine Boys? Is this going to go? I have no maybe? idea where it's going to go. I have no idea. We're just playing it by ear. We didn't know how long it was going to run. We know that it came out that I was leaving in April, which I'm yes. not. I'm not leaving in April. <laughs> well, thank goodness. We're, running, uh, we're selling tickets now to the end of June. So uh, we don't know. We're going to let it dictate what we should do mm -hmm. and where we should go. I do would, would like to tour and make some real money. <laughs> but, uh, I love this place. Those big National I mean, Actors Theater cells. Big audiences. I, I can't play tour so even. easily anymore. Yeah, it's got a little oh, baby in the one coming yes, now. Right. Right. You can't tour with infants. You can spot tour. Today it's different. You can go three weeks here, two weeks there, take a month off in between. You don't need a steady run anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we could possibly do that. We just have a couple of minutes left. I want to ask you both how you got into acting, why you decided to become actors. You, I know, grew up in Tulsa, in love with the theater from, from, from the very beginning? From the first play I saw, which was a school play, when I was about 12, I knew exactly what I was going to do. But Jack has a better story. No, it's not one story. <laughs> Shall I tell you a story? You tell my story. He was about 18 years old in Philadelphia, and he owed the bookies a lot of money, and they were going to break his legs. He had to get out of town, so he left town and became an actor. <laughs> so I read that the loan sharks were pursuing him. Well, I was a little older. I was on I had a GI Bill. I went to college, and that's how I became an actor. But the hide from Lone Sharks, I don't think, you know, going out in the middle of a stage with the spotlight on no, you would be the place to... In Pittsburgh, yeah. If you're in Philadelphia, <laughs> all the money in Philadelphia, do it on stage in Pittsburgh. It's good. And this is why he wants to tour with the Sunshine Boys, I bet. you got to get but out of wherever there. we've toured and on any movie set, one of the stage hands is always a bookie. <laughs> Otherwise, I won't go. The truth. The truth. We have a horse room wherever we are. <laughs> okay. The play is The Sunshine Boys, uh, National Actors Theatre production at the Lyceum. Really terrific play and, and really beautifully acted by Tony Randall and Jack Klugman. You've been terrific guests. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Get away from the park. <laughs> Hello. My daughter? Hello, how are you? Is it my daughter? Is it her? Can't you see I'm talking? <laughs> Don't you see me on the phone with a person? <laughs> For God's sake, behave like a human being. For five seconds, will you? Will you have five seconds? <laughs> Hello, how are you? Just a minute. It's your daughter. <laughs> I'm here in the Tony press room with Patrick Pacheco of Newsday. The Tonys are just over. A lot of surprises, Patrick. Yeah, I think so. I think obviously the biggest one is The Lion King. Everybody was predicting that Ragtime would take the top prize, but I think that as Julie Taymor said, the Tony voters voted with their heart. They voted with the experience, the great experience of their lifetime. Uh, and I think that's what sort of carried the day. It's still sort of shocking to some extent in terms of, uh, you know, what this means for live event and what it means for the future of Ragtime. What's it mean for live event? Well, I think that certainly, I think one of the thinking behind the predictions of Ragtime Ragtime winning, it is that Ragtime needed the Tony more. Uh, it needed that validation. Lion King is going through the roof. I think they just sold another four million dollars worth of tickets. And that was even before the announcement was made. Uh, so I think that Ragtime doesn't have that validation. It's going to be a little rough now in terms of its road productions. Uh, it doesn't have that patina of that the Tony gives musicals. The awards were spread out over a number of productions. Roundabout was a huge winner. Uh, winning That's remarkable. Uh, cabaret and View from the Bridge, both, and a lot of their actors won as well. So it's It'll be hard for them to live up to that. Well, I think it's going to be, it's going to raise the bar for Disney, it's going to raise the bar for the roundabout, uh, and we'll see what comes up next for these respective organizations. Well, Patrick, I hope we'll see you back next year, and before that, 
I'll tell you what, the next time Audrey McDonald's nominated, she's going to win. <laughs> she wins every she time. Wins. I, what is, 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 does three she times just, up, three what, time winner. Yeah, but what is that? Is this some magic pull she has? I mean, she's, she's good, good, but, you know. She's just, she's just good. It's, it's, she, just, she just picks her role as well. This is true. Um, and she's just really good. That was a heartbreaking performance in Ragtime. I didn't think she was going to win. Oh, no, but you she and I, we thought C.U. Loka. We thought or C. little Anna Kendra. Right, but there was it was much more complex that role. Uh, she sang her heart out. Brian Stokes Mitchell did not win, uh, and that was a surprise. But there's winners and there's losers. Okay, so you're off to the party. I'm off to the party. Yeah. A lot of surprises tonight, Michael Riedel. We predicted ragtime. You stu you said Lion King and. Uh, yeah, I think that I am the uh, only person on Broadway who said uh, that Lion King would win the Tony for for best musical. Unfortunately, I have to admit that shortly after I made the prediction on our TV show, I then went to the Daily News and and. She Changed my mind and said Ragtime was going to win Best Musical. It really was one of probably one of the closest races ever. Just a sense of momentum shifting in the theater community weeks before the show happened. But I think tonight we began to get a sense that The Lion King was going to win when on the telecast they performed the opening number of The Circle of Life. And you could see the enthusiasm, the cheering crowd at Radio City Music Hall, many of whom are Tony voters. When I saw that, I began to realize that those people were still excited by The Lion King have been swept away by the power of that production, and that's when I thought that uh, The Lion King may well beat out Ragtime for Best Musical. Well, don't you think that we temporarily lost faith in The Lion King, winning because of sort of the, of the other critics' awards that started going for right. Ragtime that snowballed? I, 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 I do, and, you know, I mean, I did a lot of reporting on the issue, and, and everyone I talked to, I guess I talked to the wrong people, though, but all the voters I talked to were going to go for... Um, for ragtime, but you know, I did talk to one voter early this evening, Tony Ward evening, and he had originally told me he was voting for ragtime, but he went back to see Lion King last week and he couldn't believe how good it was. And he said he got swept up in it again and he changed his vote to the Lion King. We will never know how many people actually saw ragtime for the first time, or, or I'm sorry, Lion King for the first time or a second time just before the Tony Awards, but I think that may have swayed a number of voters had they seen the show, if they've seen the show recently. Yes, and, and, and I think people realize that. that the Lion King is not about nothing. That right. animals getting along is well, important. It's very interesting now to compare what, what, what this award means for The Lion King. I mean, clearly Disney, the producer of The Lion King, did not need a Tony for the box office purposes. The, the show has a $45 million advance. It'll probably end up running longer than, than, than Cats. But what it gives them is, is, is valid artistic validation from a Broadway community that has been somewhat ambivalent to their arrival on the scene. I mean, Snooty about Disney. And you forget just, uh, you know, four, four or five years ago, um, uh, Beauty and the Beast lost out to the now for gotten Stephen Sondheim flop pa passion. Um, but more interesting to me, though, is what this the loss of the Tony means to Ragtime and to Live Ant, the producer, which is drowning in a sea of, of, of red ink. Um, Ragtime really needed a Tony Award. It, it appears to be selling out now, but has it has never generated the kind of excitement and buzz that The Lion King has. And well, it nothing does, has. Nothing has. But it, but for shows that cost $15, $20 million, they better damn well be generating a lot of excitement and buzz, or they aren't going to make it. And I think there's a real question hanging over the future of Ragtime. Now, I, it'll run for a year, maybe two years, but I think by the end of this year, you're going to be see, you're going to see the grosses begin to fall off. It's in a very expensive show to run. It's in a very precarious position right now. You know, it's nice and surprising that Audra McDonald won for uh, Best Featured Actor in a Musical, but you know, no, no Tony Award for Best Featured Actress ever saved uh, ever saved a, a, a musical. What's that? Audra McDonald? She sure has that magic touch, doesn't yeah, she? Absolutely. Now there was an upset kind of with Beauty Queen getting four Best Director, three performers, and then losing the Best Play to Art. Right again, you know, uh, we were all predicting uh, uh, the Beauty Queen of Leanne would win. Uh, many of us thought, well, we liked Art. Uh, the theater community seemed to think it was a little bit thin and was sort of swept up in, in, in the melodrama and intensity of, of the beauty queen of Lean Ann. It's impossible to say what tipped it. I would, if I had to guess, I would say that a number of the Tony voters are um, presenters of plays around the country. And if they voted politically and voted economically, they probably thought, surprise, surprise, right? They probably thought that, you know, art is a play that's going to 
play in the provinces, yeah. whereas the beauty queen of Lee Man, Harder to cast. Yeah, with the Irish women throwing hot oil at each other, uh, <laughs> might not go over well at the, uh, you know, Cleveland course, Center course, for the you, Performing Arts. Of course, you know, but there's a lot of actresses out there in Cleveland who want to play Irish women throwing hot oil at each other. Well, <laughs> well but you are, right, well. In regional theater, but commercial productions of art will get a big boost from, um, from this Tony Award. I mean, art, I, I believe, I would say here, w will go down in history as one of the most successful straight plays of all time. It's already returned its $1.7 million advance, and this Tony Award is just going to give it an enormous lift at, at the box office. So I think art will be around a long time. Also, it's a terrific play to recast with stars. If you can get three big names in there to come in for a limited period of time, as they're talking to the cast of Frasier about doing, uh, you could really run art for... Is that for, for real? Talking for, to the cast yeah, of Frasier? Yeah, oh. it, it is. It's not, it's not that the producers of the play are talking to the cast of Frasier. It's that the cast of Frasier actually wants to do art on Broadway. The problem is, though, that they only have a limited time frame because they they spend most of their time doing the, the TV series all right any last words uh, good you know I wish uh, I wish the Disney guys nothing but the best um, uh, Disney has really proved itself a major player not only financially but artistically on Broadway uh, this year with the Lion King they deserve everything they've gotten and I, I have to say bravo for those Irish women so we'll see you next time on Theater Talk. And now one more time, here's C.D. LaLoca and company in The Lion King. Good night. All right. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>